Hello and welcome back. My name is Gavin Fish and this is my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be talking with a friend of mine who is an entomologist and geneticist. And in the course of our conversation, we actually take a look at some photos of decomposition of an animal. So I want to give a heads up right now that if that is not your kind of thing, uh, you probably want to skip this video, but we're going to be doing it for the purpose of trying to figure out what investigators had to work with when they discovered the body of Gabby Petito. We know that Dr. Brent Blue, the Teton County uh, coroner, told us that he used forensic anthropologist and forensic entomologist in order to uh, finish his investigation into the death of Gabby Petito. And for that reason, I thought a conversation with an entomologist and a geneticist would be a good idea. So, um, yeah, I just want to give you that warning that that's what we're going to be talking about. That's what we're going to be showing. So if it's not your thing, just go ahead and skip this video. Before I go over to my interview, I do want to thank all of you who have signed up to be patrons, who have gone to my Patreon page. I really appreciate that, guys. Thank you for supporting me. If uh, you like this kind of content, one of the best ways that you can support me is to subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell, and like this video. And also, if you don't like the video, please give it a thumbs down because that gives me an indication of what kind of content you would like. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at the interview. I'd like to welcome Dr. Matthew Gruwell to my channel. Matt is a personal friend of mine. He's a professor of biology, genetics, genomics, and all of those very, very smart topics at Penn State Barron. Matt, thanks for joining me today. Oh, I'm glad to do it. So the purpose of our conversation, the reason that I reached out to you, as you know, because we talked over the weekend a couple of times, in the Gabby Petito case, Dr. Brent Blue, who is the coroner out in Teton County, Wyoming, who worked on the autopsy investigation and report of, of Gabby Petito, uh, did say to reporters that they used forensic anthropologists and forensic entomologists during their investigation of um, Gabby Petito's body. And I wanted to know kind of what that entailed. And I think you're the, you're the guy when it comes to that, right? Sure. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I do have a, a passion for entomology. I have a PhD in entomology from UMass Amherst a little while back and uh, bugs have been a major part of my life for 30 years now, I guess. So I do love entomology. I'm, I will disclaim I'm not a specific forensic entomologist. I'm sure you'll have some sleuths on there that uh, may pick up a few things more than uh, I have studied in my life. But I teach an entomology class uh, here, and I always love to talk about forensic entomology. There's a lot of clues you can get from digging into the past using, using insects, actually. So, yeah, I'm happy to kind of talk about it. Okay, so in a, you mentioned that you, you actually teach a, like a introduction to forensic entomology or, or some kind of class like that. Um, wh what, I guess, what does the study of bugs, how does that help us in, I guess, an investigation into a murder case? So that's a good question. Bugs, you know, unfortunately, or... Well, I guess people on here are interested in the crime, so it's not so graphic and unfortunate in this case, but they love to eat bodies of anything. Uh, people dislike insects greatly, but they break down everything. Yeah, with insects and then with bacteria and fungus, that's responsible for breaking down all living things. And thank goodness they do. Otherwise, our forests and all natural areas would just be covered in dead plants and fecal material and dead bodies and everything else. If they didn't break down, it'd be a pretty horrible existence for all of us. So they are a major player in breaking down dead organisms, especially when it comes to bodies. So is there a way, I mean, I'm guessing that there are probably stages, right? As, as a body, whether it's human or animal or whatever, there's probably a stage, there are stages of decomposition. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, there's definitely stages of decomposition. There's insects that like the body at different stages. 
of decomposition. So, and, and insects follow pretty hard, fast rules of growth. So, you know, you leave a piece of meat out on the counter a couple of days later, you see maggots. And for a long time, people thought, oh, maggots spontaneously combust or they just spontaneously generate out of meat. And you leave meat on, all of a sudden there's maggots, but it's not that, that, that's not the case. The flies come and land on it and they lay eggs. And then the little maggots start eating what's in there and grow. But they, you know, given the same temperatures, same conditions, uh, they grow at a pretty steady rate. So you can get an idea of when the fly was on there laying eggs, depending on the stages of the, uh, the, the maggots that are there and what we call them instars. So when they lay a first egg, then the larva starts to grow. It goes through various instars where it'll molt. You know, they have an exoskeleton, not an internal skeleton, so they can't just do absolute growth. They have to grow to their skin limits and then they shed that they grow it. They uh, have another one coming inside. So that's the next instar. Then they shed that and grow the next instar and they get bigger and bigger until they go to the pupal stage. And the pupa is kind of a stops growing, usually has a harder case, stops eating while it turns into an adult fly. And then it will hatch out and hopefully find another fly and find more rotten flesh and lay eggs on it. And and we're grateful for that. Yeah. As you, as you established, yeah, we probably, as, as humans, we really just don't like to think about that. It takes a special person who wants to think about that, but thank goodness they do because of what we learn. Right. So you mentioned something about like at a given temperature. So in the case of Gabby Petito, where she was outdoors from the helicopter shots and everything that I've seen, it appears that her body was found in kind of a stony, maybe even like there was some dirt, but lots of rocks uh, kind of along a Creek in the, you know, late August to mid to late September of, of Wyoming and up in the Tetons. So I'm not sure what elevation they were at, but I would imagine it's pretty high elevation, 5,000, 6,000 feet, something like that. Does, would a forensic entomologist take all of that into consideration in figuring out, you know, the, the decay of the body. Yeah, absolutely. You have to know what organisms are there. There's lots of different kinds of flies, depending on the part of the world you're in. So you got to know what to expect there. Different beetles are going to come to the body as well. Also, there's going to be a whole, whole host of different insects that will be attracted to a body uh, that's outdoors like that. But you're going to have to take into consideration elevation is too, like you said, how hot it is during the day and how cold it is during the night. Usually they'll try and average out temperatures over time because that does make a difference in how fast that little fly can grow, right? And so, you know, it's gonna be baking hot sun during the day in Wyoming in August. I've been there lots of times in the summertime. It's, it's, it's brutally hot for the most part, especially this year it was really hot. And so all that all has to be taken into consideration. So it's not a it's not terribly easy. I'll say that forensic entomologists have their work cut out for them. Uh, you got to start with working with some pretty gross circumstances, unfortunately. But you also have to be very thorough, very careful. You have to be very thoughtful about it and try and think through what are the conditions. You know, plus, well, there, there's just so many things that can go into it. You can go through multiple cycles. Uh, she was out there. How many days did you say? Uh, so the coroner says three to four weeks. I think that we've narrowed it down though, to probably August 27th to September 19th. Okay. That, that turns out to be, what is that? 19. That's, that's like just over three weeks. Over three weeks. So a lot of the things that are going to come first to that body will have actually gone and left. Uh, the things that need really fresh, uh, I'm sorry, this is. I'm not trying yeah. to be too graphic, but yeah, I'm go ahead. Trying to consider the audience. Uh, it's it's going to be you know fresh um, flesh that's going through the early stages of rotting versus what's going to be coming around later on. Uh, things will eat hides. They'll eat everything down to the bone eventually. Um, and I imagine she was pretty far along, uh, having been three and a half weeks or so. Okay. So that, that makes me ask a question. Does it, does it happen outside in? Does it like, 
would the bugs that get on her first be the ones that are attracted to fresh skin? And then once that's all gone, then it goes into the musculature and the, I don't know, all of the organs and stuff like that down to the bone or how, how would you expect the decomposition to work like that? Pretty much it's going to be all, all parts at the same time. Uh, actually I have, maybe we can go in. I have a few images of experiments that were done. I'm going to pull up, let's see, share my screen here. I'm just going to go full screen with this PowerPoint. So the body's going to go through different stages of decay. And each one of those is going to be inundated with all sorts of different insects. There's going to be insects that crawl up from below that are underneath the, the organism. And there's going to be insects that are digging through the insides of it that are uh, working on the skin and they're going to come at different stages as well. So as you look at the different stages of decomposition of an organism, we'll just say an organism for this. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a, there's a lot of experiments that have gone on. In fact, I'm going to go back just a little bit here. Uh, let's see. So as, it, as, you, as you look at it, different insects are gonna to wanna to hit at different times. Like the necrophage is the first species that feed on the corpse. Uh, a lot of flies and a lot of beetles just going after the flesh of the thing. Uh, they're gonna get in the omnivores. There's gonna be other or organisms that just anything, they'll, they'll eat anything. So they don't care, wasps, ants, beetles. They're not necessarily laying eggs in the, in the organism to have their larvae feed on it like a fly, like a lot of these different flies will do, but they will attack it. Uh, and they'll actually be eating the flies that are, and they'll, they'll be kind of just going after anything that's there. Uh, but they might actually, as you can see, it might actually slow the rate of decomposition because they may be attacking the things that are going after them. Uh, other parasites and predators, other beetles and other true flies will show up there and then incidentals. Uh, all sorts of different organisms are going to be coming after that body as it's as it's there. Here's kind of a breakdown, and obviously we can't read this, but people have spent a lot of time trying to work through what organism is going to show up when. So you can see at the top, there's oh, yeah. the three different stages: the putrefaction, the black putrefaction, the butyric fermentation, then dry decay. And then the organisms that are going to show up at different points in time, the ones at the top are the ones of the succession organisms. They're the ones that matter, the ones that you care about, because they're going to really help you time out how long a body may have been there. So with Gabby, you know, they they found the body at a certain point of time. It shouldn't been seen for a long time. So right. there was a pretty good guess. It was, it was less guesswork as how long she'd been there, but it was surely still informative as to how long her body had probably been at that exact spot. There's a lot of things you can learn from this. You can learn in some cases if a body was moved uh, from one place to another. Uh, you can learn how long it was exposed to the outside, uh, whether or not it was maybe wrapped up in something for a period of time, because sometimes decay will take place before any insects can get onto it. If if it was enclosed in a bag or something along those lines and then brought to a certain location, if, if it was, you know, the two locations were drastically different, then maybe insects would have infested the body early on. And then if a body was moved to a totally different location with a different flora of, or, of insects in that area, then you'd be like, well, why are, why are the remnants of these insects there versus the other ones that you're seeing that are actually native to the area in Wyoming, something now, like is, that. Is that true even when, like, say, for example, um, I'm not saying that this is the case, but if if Brian Laundry killed Gabby Petito like 50 miles away outside of where she was found or, or even closer than that, 10 or 20 miles away, and then he, he dumped her where they found her, is there a big enough difference even between just the matter of tens of miles, 20, 50 miles, something like that, the different kind of insects? 
probably not in a place in a place like Wyoming, probably not, right? A lot of desert and mountain, and that's about all you get in Wyoming. Uh, it would have to be two very different ecosystems. Okay. So, and especially somewhere out like out here, you you can go from your house to my house, a hundred miles away, and it's all deciduous northeast forest. A lot of the really same organisms. But in a place like Wyoming, if she was killed at a lower elevation and brought to a high elevation or vice versa, you can get different insects and things that way. But it would have to sit for a while and then be moved for things to get really get into it. Uh, so you're probably not going to learn that information. Then again, I, like I said, I am not a forensic entomologist. They can do some pretty amazing stuff these days. So there's, there's a lot that can be learned. Uh, from gotcha. so okay. Let's really quick. I was going to show you those insect or those images of the, the pig. So we have a few different stages of decay. We got the fresh decay first, you know, after it's first killed and bloat, uh, and decay, post-decay, and dry skeletal. And you can see here, so in this case, uh, they brought out a pig, uh, had it completely wrapped up, uh, a little dead baby pig, uh, for the experiment's sake. And they're, in this case, they're going to be recording uh, the temperature through the time that it's there, all the organisms that come to it, how the, how the body itself is decomposing. So we're not going to go through all the nitty-gritty details of that, you can learn a lot from an experiment like this. Um, way back when, the first person that kind of pioneered this, uh, it was in a guy, he had 150 human corpses out of what they called the body farm. He was a... Uh, oh, yeah, I have read about that. Yeah. Okay, out in Tennessee. And he would put it, he would try in all sorts of different temperatures, times of year, times of day. Uh, trying to figure out what was going on. But anyway, let's just go through this little one. So obviously shortly after uh, death and that fresh, you get into the bloating stage. And you can see here around the face, especially places it's easy to get into the organism. Again, not to be too graphic, but entry points. A lot of things can't break the skin as easily. So if there's an entry point like mouth, eye sockets, ears, things like that, that they can really get in, especially with something like a pig, really tough hide. Uh, that's where you'll really start to see it kind of work through and, and things are really taken to ripping apart the skin in that stage, uh, going to the next, now we're in kind of the decay stage and you can see fluids are coming out of the organism. It's broken out, uh, leaking unpleasant odors. Uh, the gases have kind of left as well because they've all been able to escape and, insects at this point are really taking to the body and just really taking it apart uh, quite heavily at this point. Uh, and then our post decay stage, I imagine this would be multiple weeks uh, given the environment in uh, Wyoming during the summer uh, was probably somewhere around this stage. Things have been eaten away quite a bit uh, and not a lot would be left at that point. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't know exactly, you know, if it's really cold at night, that's going to slow it down quite a bit. I don't know exactly what was going on at that point in time with, with the body. Now it says hide beetles are dominant in dry environments, which, uh, the Grand Teton area that, that is still considered high desert, is it not? Oh yeah. Very, and especially this year, extremely dry. So you're going to have a lot of hide beetles, carrion beetles and things that can I uh, chew through the toughest parts of it at this point in time uh, in the decay process. All the flies, they've done everything they can. There's, there's not a lot for maggots at this point to really do on the body. It's going to be mostly just the uh, hide beetles and other things that can chew up really tough. Ants probably could still do some damage here, that sort of stuff. Mm. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it for. Wow. For the last stage just being the dry stage of just the skeletal remains. So, so I, that actually, the, that image of what was left of that pig after a few weeks, whatever. Um, so that makes me wonder what the condition of Gabby's body was. And I'm like, I don't want to be disrespectful, especially to her family, but just in the sake of trying to understand the evidence that they may have been able to collect. 
um, you know, the, the cause of death that they found was manual strangulation. And there are, um, there are telltale signs of manual tr- strangulation that we all know is true crime nerds. Uh, one of them is like a broken hyoid bone. There are other cartilages in the neck that are broken. And so at that point, like at the stage, that last stage of the pig carcass that you just showed us, those things would be evident, right? But maybe like petechiae in the eyes, they never would see that because the eyes would be gone at that point, right? Yeah. Eyes would be the very first thing to go. Mm. Always. So it, if he strangled her manually, which is what they ruled, that means that he used his hands, right? He's, he didn't use a garret or a ligature or something like that. In... I guess in investigations these days, and this kind of goes into another realm where you're an expert in, in, in the realm of DNA, we know that there is such thing as touch DNA. Like if, if, you know, if somebody grabs me by the neck, it's possible that they left skin cells or sweat or oils from their hands on my neck. And that DNA may be able to be, um, processed, I I guess is the word that I would think of. But in the case of Gabby Petito, if she were in the same condition as that pig carcass, would they be able to get, uh, I guess, foreign DNA off of her body? Uh, Yeah, that's a, that's a a good question. Again, uh, not being a forensic geneticist, they've got, they've got great tools, but I can't see Number one, how uh, it would still be around. Now, DNA is very robust. It, it'll stand the test of time. Uh, it'll, it'll hang out for a long time in the right conditions. Dry is really good. Dry is really good for preserving DNA because you don't get a lot of excess bacteria and other things like that that'll chew it up. Uh, you want things dry, but hot is bad for DNA. Dry, cold, obviously the very best. And hot and wet is kind of the, the worst for preserving DNA outdoors. So I, I can't see, I can't, I mean, I can't see anything off her skin because I imagine that there's, you know, again, I don't know the exact conditions. Her skin may have been preserved. It may not have had the right insects at the time there. Uh, there may have been some skin. But at the same time, it's hard to say what, what would you get out of that? Well, we know she was with Brian Laundrie for a long time, for weeks and weeks. A defense could easily say, well, yeah, there's his DNA there because they were hanging out together all the time. He touched her all the time. Uh, They were supposedly together and dating and everything like that. So that wouldn't be definitive of anything that I can imagine. The only thing I could think of is, the thought being, let's try and collect DNA samples to see if anybody else's DNA hits. If we if we find someone else that was possibly there, you know, around her in the last little bit. I, I looked at a few resources earlier today. I was trying to figure it out, and I found a couple of cool papers that were trying to that were trying to experiment with how long DNA might last. I'll, I'll read you a couple of little uh, snippets that I found that. I found interesting. I said, above all, it depends on whether DNA is exposed to heat, water, sunlight, and oxygen. If a body is left out in the sun and rain, its DNA will be useful for testing for only a few weeks. If it's buried a few feet below ground, the DNA will last for 1,000, 10,000 years. If it's frozen in Antarctic ice, it could last a few hundred thousand years. So they're saying with a body, even her body might be difficult to get much DNA out of, let alone trace or touch DNA, right? Another experiment they did. Sorry, go ahead. No, well, I was just going to say that if uh, Dr. B- Dr. Brent Blue said that they used DNA in their investigation, maybe it's more realistic to conclude that they used DNA to test to make sure that it was her, like it was an identifying of her, not necessarily gathering evidence against her killer. Yeah. If it was a hair, a hair is which presumably if they're together, a hair would be a lot easier to get DNA out of. They've taken DNA out of hair that's frozen in the tundra for 20,000 years. So hair would last probably preserving DNA inside of it uh, for that period of time. 
another one, just to, as we're talking clothes and things, this was an interesting study. They put DNA, trace amounts of DNA on clothes, and now they put them in water rather than out in the dry desert. Uh, but in this one, they said, uh, the long exposure time still resulting in a complete profile was two weeks for sample with skin cells in pond in the pond during winter. In the summer, the time period for erasing the bulk of DNA was four hours regarding epithelial samples for more than one day or blood samples in the pond and river environments. So in the summer, now granted that's in water and water is going to have more biological activity going on that can break it down. In fact, Interestingly enough, it's one of the big research projects I have going on right now is looking at the presence of eDNA in water in the Great Lakes to try and identify invasive species through environmental DNA. That's what eDNA is. So we're trying to figure out how fast it breaks down. Um, and we're finding it breaks down fairly quickly, but again, that's in water. This last one says experimental results demonstrate the ability to recover DNA from human cells on outdoor services decreases significantly over two weeks. Mm. Firstly, no clear chance were identified for casework data indicating that many other factors are involved affecting the recovery of trace DNA. Nevertheless, to ensure that valuable trace evidence is not lost, it's recommended that crime scenes are processed expeditiously. So, okay, so I'm going to ask a, like a seriously gross question here. So, people watching, if this grosses you out, you turn off right now. I'm giving you a warning right now. But okay, the first question I asked was about touch DNA, right? But what about DNA from, um, from like semen and stuff like that? Not necessarily on her, but in her. Right. I mean, it sounds to me like that's a pretty tall order to that. That would still be in existence by the time they found Gabby. Yeah. I, I agree with that. You know, I, again, I, I, I apologize for the grossness, but, any way into an organism is the first place insects are going to go to get into the body. They right. don't, a fly, you know, a fly lands on your skin. It can't pierce through your skin very easily. Uh, so when it lays a little maggot on there, it wants a place internal if it can get it right. Um, so, so the anus, the vagina, the urethra, the ears, the eye sockets, the nose, mouth, all that, that's where they go. Yeah, that's where that's that's your highest likelihood of of getting your larvae to survive to the next generation, right? Mm. And good tissue that's that's just breakable, breakdownable. Okay, so but I like the I guess the point that you're making is that it probably wouldn't matter if they found Brian Laundry's DNA because they were together, but there would be some value in, I guess, um, uh, ruling out other people, right? Like if, if they found a hair that did not belong to Gabby and did not belong to Brian Laundry, then that would be evidentially very, very powerful. And then yeah, that'd probably put them to the top of the suspect list, right? Say that again. So that probably put them to the top of the suspect list, right? If, if they have found recent evidence of DNA of somebody else. Right. But it, I, I guess the inverse of that is that if they can rule out that other people weren't there, that only Brian Laundry was there, that is also valuable as far as circumstantial evidence, right? Yeah. You're the expert here. But yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I'm just, I'm just doing a a mental exercise on that, but yeah, seeing the images of the pig carcass that I think that gives us a, uh, I think that gives us a better idea, a better understanding of probably the condition of her body by the time they found her. Yeah. And that's the thing. If her wallet is not there, if her, well, you, you mentioned it actually yourself, the uh, forensic anthropologist, is that what? Yeah. Looking at that pig carcass, that's probably why that person was called in to try and identify the body because it wasn't someone that looked like the pictures of her. Probably. Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I, she probably was not recognizable. That's so sad. But I think one of the things that they announced back on the 19th when they found her is that they um, identified her um, by the clothes that she was wearing you know, and, uh, that, that was at least initially how they did that. And then they probably, 
did something else, dental records or, or DNA or something like that. Yeah. And bone, bone and hair will hold DNA for a while, especially bone. I mean, bone, there's, there's evidence 10,000 plus years, people in caves digging up bones and finding out who they are or not who they are. We don't know who they are, but you know, that they're homo sapiens or Neanderthals or whatever species, you know, the various species roaming the earth uh, early with early man and before. Yeah. I think one of the first conversations you and I ever had about DNA, just, we were just chatting, getting to know each other. Cause we've only known each other four years or so. Uh, I think you told me that like Matt, the, um, the entire genome of a woolly mammoth was able to be mapped out based on hair, right? That was yeah, thousands that's of years the, old. Shout out for Penn State, where I work for now. It was a, it was a researcher at Penn State, you know, University Park, uh, that did that woolly mammoth genome. And my favorite part of the story is that they got the hair from eBay. They, <laughs> they bought it, you know, like, how can we get a woolly mammoth sample? Like, oh, there's some on sale on eBay. Let's buy some hair. And um, the tools are getting pretty good. They're getting really, really good. Still yeah. can't do dinos. I don't think we'll ever be able to do dinosaurs. They've been around, you know, gone for 65 million years. DNA is not that good, but. It won't last that long, huh? Yeah. No Jurassic Park in the immediate future? Not in the immediate future, sadly. Well, no, I don't know that that is sad. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think that was more of a cautionary tale when that was written. Fantastic, but. <laughs> well, Matt, thank you very much. I mean, that was, that's very helpful in understanding kind of what they were dealing with at the coroner's office there. That's a, it's a horrific story. One of the things that I've been impressed with though, is Gabby Petito's family, both the Petitos and the Schmitz is that they've been trying really hard to make sure that other, other people's children or loved ones, you know, spouses that suffer similar fates to Gabby will somehow get the uh, same kind of attention that Gabby Petito has, because it has been, it, it's ultimately been helpful one in finding her and two in uh, figuring out what the timeline was that has all come from just public attention, social media. Yeah. Well, people like you and your followers, you guys are putting in the time that a lot of people don't have to put in for a case like this. So it's a great service, I think. Well, I hope so. I mean, <laughs> I, sometimes I think I'm just a talking head, but, uh, I, oh, I think look, at, look at Amanda's case. That's, that's definitely made differences there. That's yeah. We're two days away from, uh, from our next hearing on that one, by the way, I've been, been working with the lawyers on that all day today. So yeah, if uh, viewers, if you don't know about the Amanda Winkowski case, go, go check out my playlist. It's a, it's a doozy. It, it is. I, I, ironically, I lived in Buffalo at the time that that happened. Gavin, and I have talked at length about that because there's a lot more DNA evidence in that one than, uh, yeah. than we, in this one, it's very applicable. Now, but that's a good example. If your body was frozen solid, that's best way to preserve DNA. And there was probably some um, sexual crimes involved in that. So yeah, it's very applicable. Yeah. The, well, the, and the, I guess the second or third or fourth tragedy and all that is that that was ignored by the, by the investigator. Well, I wouldn't say the police investigators, but the other investigators that were involved uh, mm -hmm. that didn't go anywhere. But anyway, Matt, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you making time. And hopefully as we have other questions from viewers that have to do with the biology of, uh, of crime, uh, you'll make yourself available to us. Is that okay? Yeah. Anytime. Awesome. I'd like to thank Professor Matthew Gruel from Penn State Barron for joining us today on this video. I personally really enjoyed his insight, and I think that I've got a better grip on what investigators like Dr. Brent Blue uh, were dealing with or what they were dealing with in order to find that cause and manner of death. Uh, I hope that you guys liked this video. If you did, please don't forget to subscribe or thumbs up. If you do want to support me in uh, ways deeper than that, there's a link to my Patreon account below. I appreciate each and every one of you that support me this way. 
The next thing in the Gabby Petito case is really gonna boil down to Brian Laundry and his family. So I will keep my eye open to, um, to what it is that they're doing and I'll bring you any news and commentary as I get it. As you find documents that you think I should share on my website, please uh, go over to my website and hit the contact me and send those my way. I really appreciate that. And um, the next person I think I'm probably gonna bring on when it comes to uh, maybe digging into the details of the Gabby Petito case is my friend, uh, Dr. Kenny Clark, who's a forensic pathologist. He is a former medical examiner in the states of New York and Pennsylvania, and he's got terrific insight. I'm still trying to set that up. I'll let you guys know when I do. And with that, I shall bid you adieu. I hope to see you the next time. Take care. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.